Okay, hello everyone. So can everyone hear me at, at every corner? Is that good? Okay, excellent. Okay, so I wanted to give five extra minutes because the keynote did run long, and I think we're, we're at that now. So we're here to talk about archiving, auditing, discovery, and device protection. That's a bit of a mouthful. And we still haven't found a good acronym for our team, so please, if you have ideas, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. We've, we've toyed with AEDA, DEAA. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't roll off the tongue. So, yeah. So, and, and yes, welcome to give feedback on what you do not want to hear. Um, and really, to make it simpler, it's really an exchange in Office 365 compliance overview. Look at these technologies and how they apply to the server. My name is Kamal Janarathan, and I am the group program manager of the, in, the exchange information protection team for these areas. So, how many folks have seen me present before? Excellent. So this is a journey that we have taken together. As you have seen me take on different roles, always in this area, um, and as you have seen us evolve over here, really this feature set that we built today is because of those hands that I saw raised. I've had some wonderfully positive and wonderfully authentic and honest feedback from this room. So thank you for that. That's why we built what we've got here today. So to talk a little bit about why we're here for all the folks who didn't raise their hands. So with circa 2002, where effectively corporations stopped becoming completely trusted entities. So around 2002, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, FRCP, HIPAA regulations, all of these came to be applied, not just for paper records, but also for electronic records. So really, this was a huge shift in the industry. They'd always had the notion that you could have paper records, you would put them in this box, this box would exist in some vault, and you'd be fine. Then suddenly, the realization started coming to um, regulation agencies and litigation that really most of the data in the world today isn't really in those paper records. It's electronic. So how do we regulate that? How do we manage that? And of course, um, out of that grew a multi-billion dollar industry. Backup vendors, uh, transport rules providers, client uh, Outlook plugins, all of these players, small players in the market, came to fulfill a need that customers had about giving you compliance across your enterprise. So legal and regulatory requirements and organizational governments requests. A third piece of this, though, was as the volume of data in electronic records actually grew, along with it came threats, internal and external. You could get data about salary information, or you could get data about national secrets. How many people in the room have heard of um, this little-known gentleman called Snowden? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, if we were ever in, in concern that this wasn't going to be an important session, this wasn't going to be an important area, Snowden certainly took that away. And so what we found is the preponderance of data in those stores, electronic data, means there are more internal and external threats. The cost and impact, if that data becomes lost or becomes exposed to inappropriate um, audiences, is very high. And so corporations have to do something to protect themselves. The challenges of that protection, so this is one of the cool things that when I first started, an, an IT admin told me, he said, you know the big problem with our system? We have so many users. So it's an interesting thought. The perfect, most secure, easiest to manage system is one where you don't have any users. It's also the empty house. Nobody lives in it. So one of our goals here is effectively the challenges that come with trying to govern and manage this data is that end user experience and end user productivity gets impacted if you create a compliance workflow that sits right in their face. So one of the ways that this very starkly came up three or four years ago was we had a third party stubbing solution that one of our customers had deployed. And we've come a long way since then with um, Exchange and other partners, and that solution had effectively brought down their Exchange servers because of the way it placed load on the mailbox. So effectively, an end user went to do their job. Um, the archiving service that was making sure that all the content they created and edited was pushed off to a third-party store suddenly gave them a, what we call the wheel of death. They couldn't actually access their email anymore. So one of the key tenets of compliance is we have to make sure that end user productivity isn't impacted, however we do it. The second piece of this that customers have come to us and you have come to us telling us is, OK, if I have to do governance and compliance of my system, does it have to be that I deploy an entirely separate infrastructure? The overhead of cost and management of that is enormous. And we hear re repeatedly from customers, you own the data, you own the store. 
It would be really nice if you made it easier to govern and provide compliance. And the third piece of it, end users, IT admin, is that when you have a system that is spread out in all these various seams, compliance is about trust and clarity of the operation or the policy you're applying. When you have these various systems and all these various seams, the possibility of error goes up. The moment the possibility of error goes up, you can't really trust your compliance system. So what we found in, the, in organizations where people were spending enormous amounts of time creating these incredibly detailed documents about how you would administer the policy, then the poor beleaguered IT person actually applying the policy in the system, he didn't read all 150 pages of it. Right? He had a conversation with the legal person, grokked about 30% of it, and that's what you got applied in the system. So these are the three things we really heard from our customers. It's too hard to apply, it's too expensive, and really my end users hate it. So the ask to us is, make it easier for my end users, make it cheaper, and please make it so my compliance officers can sleep at night. Because if they don't sleep at night, guess who they're going to call up? That's the IT admins and us. So how are we going to solve this problem? The first one that I spoke about is empowering the end user. So from a Microsoft perspective, the first thing we want to do is make sure that Outlook, OA, SharePoint, all the Office apps, every place that your end user actually manages their data, that's where compliance happens. If you ever need an end user action to apply compliance in your enterprise, it should happen within their workflow. And really, we want to ensure that the end users barely ever have to know. This is something that you should be able to do as a compliance officer and an IT admin without your end users being in the picture. They should be going off creating new drugs, writing filing patents for the company, um, running manufacturing processes. They should not be worrying about compliance for a corporate organization. The second piece of our vision, and you heard about this in the keynote, is enabling the compliance officer. So this is where the compliance officer today has to have this fairly heavyweight relationship with IT or the data is put away in a completely separate system and they have to manage it independently there. Our hope and our role is to give you high quality compliance functionality, and it's a long roadmap, while reducing the need for that detailed 100 page doc conversation with the IT admin. Unless, of course, they're writing it for pleasure, which some of our IT departments too, which is perfectly reasonable. The third piece of the puzzle is easy for IT. So one of the conversations that I've gotten in this room a lot, and in general, is, come on, do you care about on-premise? Well, that third pillar is really about on-premise. What we're trying to build, and particularly for compliance, one of the pieces of feedback we get, Office 365 is extremely important for us. We want to give you the very best Office 365 compliance solution there is. But we also realize, particularly for our compliance customers, that they're going to want to keep their compliance administration on-premise the longest. So, in all honesty, we want to get you to the cloud. But we also realize we're not going to do it by all stick. You must go to the cloud. No, that's, that's not the, the methodology or the intent. The intent is we want to make the cloud so attractive that you'll want to move there. But if you want to stay on premise, the third pillar there is our promise to you. And the last one, in place and extensible. So the first three pillars are really something that all compliance solutions aspire to. The third one is really very few software providers can aspire to. And this is to build all the functionality I described previously in the platform. To build it into Exchange, SharePoint, Windows, Yammer. Every single asset that Microsoft has in the fullness of time, we want the compliance to be built in over there. So you don't have to deploy a separate add-in or a plug-in in that space. Extensible means we realize and we understand that in that roadmap there will be things we don't fulfill. So we want your feedback on how we can make sure that the parts of it that we can't fulfill, partners can jump in and build, or your internal development teams in a corporation can jump in and build. Because a roadmap is a long thing. We want you along for the long term, and in the short term, if we can't fulfill your needs, we want to be extensible so you can. The end user workflow in the office client experience I listed should be unchanged, and one of the key piece of um, investment that we're making right now for the compliance officer that I'd like to call out, which is the third bullet there, is to make all of this possible, we are building something that you should have heard about before, which is called the Unified Compliance Console. So we call this in, uh, in the dev team, we, we came up with many names from it, it was, um, what was it, One Console to Rule Them All, that was a popular one. Um, yeah, um, and, but then that, that sort of sounded a little bit, uh, yeah, kind of uh, somber, and, and uh, we thought it might drive away our customers who uh, were more um, aligned with, say, Frodo instead of uh, Sauron. So, um, 
But uh, the idea is effectively that when we talk about giving you a single solution across all of them, we want to give you a single place to do it. And this is a schematic diagram of how we plan to get there. So today, and folks who've seen my presentation before have seen the evolution of this picture over the years. It should be familiar. On the right-hand side, uh, my right, what we have is the world as we see today. Right? You have all these workloads. You take the data out of the workloads. You put it in a separate third-party solution, and you get um, e-discovery compliance, all these functions across it. If you want to do particular, say, transport rules, or you want to do sort of orchestra client-type functionality, you have to deploy an add-in into Outlook or one of the clients or on the transport servers to allow you to enable this functionality. And you have to deploy semantic or third-party software that will manage all of this for you. This has the challenges I described in, in, on the first slide. And our goal is, if you wish to do this, that is absolutely your call. We, however, do want to give you an easier alternative. The alternative is here on this side, on, on the, uh, my left, left-hand side, which is effectively we want to take the workloads and we want to build into the workloads the platform capability that will give you immutability, deletion, preservation, e-discovery, uh, data loss prevention, all these functionalities that are actually in these individual workloads. We then want to build what I call sort of the unified compliance console on top of that. So if you look at the top part, one of the things that was on the first slide was you had these end user workflows about collaborating, creating a document, sending email. We want our compliance console and all these properties of auditing, archiving, discovering, encrypting, data loss prevention, preservation, and deletion. Imagine getting all that into a single team acronym. So, um, but we want to build all of those into the clients as well as the server workloads and give you a management experience across it. The extensible part of it is we want to index or ingest. So indexing means you keep this content in its workload, but we, using our fast connectors, and this is sort of the long-term roadmap, give you the ability to index that content so when you actually do a discovery of it, you're able to see it in the unified e-discovery space. Where you don't want to index it, where, for example, the content doesn't really have a compliance store or a, it is a short-term, um, short-lived data, for example, Bloomberg messages, right? You're not going to index those in place because the Bloomberg service is in the cloud and it's not going to allow you to index that content. What we want to do is give you the ability to ingest that into the service. So one of the investments, and really I have a lot of my team in this front row who are building all this stuff, so um, one of our investments is effectively to make that ingestion easier into the platform. So those are your two options for extensibility. And of course, goes without saying, we're interested in the need and the ask for an API layer that will make that ingestion and that extensibility popular or easier. So please give us feedback on that. So one of the coolest things about these sessions is that what we do is we take all the feedback and we order our features. And we look at them and we say, OK, do you think we got feedback to push this one higher or lower? And that's a conversation that our team and we would love to have with you. And it will be really, um, this is how we made a lot of the decisions on this roadmap that gives you the functionality you see today that I've gotten feedback from all the familiar faces I see, is we asked you, did you want to move it up or down the feature list? And you get a sense of the hard trade-offs we have to make, but you also get a sense of how you can directly influence us. And I already mentioned the unified compliance experience. Okay, so our roadmap on where we've been, where we're going. So this is for all the folks, I think it was half the room who raised their hands about you know, the journey they've taken with us. So I talked about where the world is today and where we want to get, where you have the in-place functionality and the um, compliance capabilities above it. So I took that diagram, and now I'm sort of painting for you a bit of the story that you've been with us. So this was in 2010, I think it's the first time we did a session on archiving where we talked about, um, does anyone remember our conversation about tiered storage? Can I just see a show of hands? Pretty good. So for folks who, um, for folks who are, and, and, and there's a contingent of folks who've been with us a long time in, in that section. So really, um, what we started in 2010 was we want to build into SharePoint and Exchange an immutable layer, the immutable platform. Well, this allows you to say, so previously, you always had to take the data out because we could not guarantee for you that in the workload, you could ensure the data wasn't changed by the end user or destroyed by the admin. So what we did by building that immutable platform made it such that the only way you can destroy that data 
is by actually kicking the server over, and that is true of every server in the world. Hopefully you have additional copies in a faraway country that no one else can get to, so that, that won't cause the damage as well. So starting in 2010, what we built was the immutable platform into Exchange and SharePoint. As you can see over there, we had separate experiences at that time. So we told you, you know what, we want to build this end place, and what you told us was, it's great that you want to do all this in the workload and not take the data out, but how are you going to give me a single experience across them? So immutable platform was one. The second piece of it that we built in 2013, that we kind of our first step in that direction was to give you e-discovery across email and documents and the ability to bring link archiving data into Exchange. What we heard from you is that's really great. You're taking a step in the right direction. What about things other than Microsoft stores was the one question I heard a lot of. And the second question was, are you telling me I have to deploy an entire SharePoint farm to get email search? So how many folks feel that that is a, um, deploying the SharePoint requirement for e-discovery was a reasonable ask? How many folks feel it was, okay, so I saw a couple of hands say it was a reasonable ask. How many folks feel that it would have been much preferable to be able to just build it into use exchange and extend it? Okay, well, this is an exchange audience, so that's not surprising. So um, I asked this in the SharePoint conference, by the way, and I get a, they're like, what are you talking about? We, sh we, sh we search mostly documents. It's great. So... The, the joy of being Microsoft and the joy of having a team that ships code into both Exchange and SharePoint, two of the fastest growing server products in, in Office, is that we have to satisfy all of you. Um, and, and we've known you longer, so no, just kidding, kidding. <laughs> that's, um, I, I have a couple of folks from SharePoint in my team, and so, you know. That's, um, on the unified side, so what we, we heard your feedback, and really the unified compliance console is taking all the goodness and all the infrastructure logic we build that is completely reusable and putting it into a console and an experience that is not workload specific, does not require you to deploy that separate load that will be built on one of the existing loads. So that's another thing to keep in mind. That's our intention there. So we did the first step in the direction of the experience and the infrastructure, and we built it on SharePoint, we got your feedback, we're going to actually extend that story. Another new investment that we're looking at um, is and I hear this all the time, how many folks think the Exchange Archive, as it is today, is large enough for you? Okay, okay, cool. It's good, good. How many folks think you would like a bigger archive on a, for per users with an Exchange, with an Office 365? Okay, so more hands. That wasn't a trick question, by the way. Do you want it bigger? The question is, do you want us to go bigger and faster or not, right? I should have asked it like a car question. Do you want a bigger, faster car? Yeah. Um, Ah, great question. So the gentleman, I'll repeat the question. The gentleman said, what does a bigger archive really mean? And I think that may be why people were like, I think I want it bigger. So hold that thought. I will talk a little bit more about what bigger archives mean, and you can tell me if you care about it. Thank you. Um, another piece of investment there is we're doing all this great work to protect your data on, on, on PCs and desktops. But really, where does most of the end user work happen? On your device platform. So those of you who saw our new CEO, Satya Nadella, talk about our new investments of Office on um, all devices, because we want to get it to all our consumers, a piece of that investment that he even mentioned, if you saw the press release, was about data protection. And that's something we're investing in. If you're delivering all this compliance functionality to PCs, we have to deliver it to devices as well. And long term, if we started with in-place archiving, we moved to the unified experience, and we're making investments in that, and making it better. And finally, the third place that we land up in is the extensible platform. And this is what we call bring the data home. So ensuring that if you really want a compliance solution that's expansive, we provide a home for any piece of it. So how many folks are familiar with EHA migrations? Okay, a small set of hands. So this is part of that effort. Um, providing ingestion of very large PSCs third party. So we currently have a very large it's a university or, or state customer in Office 365 who wants to move, hold your breath, um, actually, how many folks think uh, they want to, what's the largest amount of terabytes move that you've ever had to do? How many folks have had to move um, a terabyte of PSTs into the, okay, cool. I see some Microsoft folks raising their hands. We, we know you. <laughs> um, how many folks have had to move between one and 10 terabytes into the cloud? Wow. Okay, wow, impressive. We, by the way, we really want the feedback from you folks at the unplugged session and at the booth. How many folks have had to move between 10 and 50 terabytes into the cloud or into, a, into the platform exchange? Wow. Okay. And greater than 50 terabytes? 
Wow. Okay, well, that is, sorry, say Okay, and public folders, that's right, good, thank you. That's right. You know what, we, we never have a session where public folders doesn't come up. It's like, it's good. It's, it's, it's the old friend, and I actually will have something to say about it in the later slides, so please hold that thought. So we currently have a customer who wants to move 600 terabytes into Office 365, and we are looking at working through our existing solution. That essentially, we're in what we call flighting, which is you build it, and then you put the works on it. You actually move a ton of data using it. And we are in the process of actually running through that with our internal MSIT, because we have about you know, 60 to 100 terabytes, and then once we're done with them, we're gonna go and service this customer. So that ask is very real to us, and we take that very seriously, because we realize a big part of an archive and a lot of things that it triggers is also cleanup of your system and bringing the data in, so we hear you there. So that's the roadmap, and now I'm gonna show you the compliance center. So this is code that is like written within a matter of like weeks ago. It's very fresh. Um, there, there is risk involved in demoing it, right? It's, MEC is one of the conferences I would take that risk. I, I wouldn't in a, in a lot of others. So the thing, um, does everyone want to see the demo or should we just play it safe and I'll keep talking? See the demo, okay. Okay, great. What an awesome audience. Okay. Okay, great. So that is the Compliance Center. It may not look like anything special at first glance, but what lies behind this particular page is all the authentication, authorization, and storage framework going off to SharePoint, Exchange, Link, all of these workloads that we're trying to provide compliance for and surfacing them in this single page. So this was the work of many teams. And our goal was, at first, when we say in place, in place, it's about giving you a single experience wherever your data lives. Well, this is the step in that direction. It is also our answer to the fact that you don't have to deploy a separate workload if you already have one. So on this, I have, these are my options, and these various pieces of functionality will grow. You will expect to see devices here at some point, right? You'll have device mobile protection. The other thing right now in its first avatar that we will be sending out or putting out sooner rather than later is even before we do some of the infrastructure to build functionality that spans a lot, we will be bringing all the various links in the same place. So it's a small thing, but our customers have given us some feedback. I think the, the first low-hanging fruit to us was, seriously, your admin experience, please just give me a single place. I don't have to create bookmarks of all your stuff. Okay, we heard you, right? I, it, admittedly, we were a little embarrassed that that was your feedback, but, but this is to fulfill that need. So say I'm gonna actually click manage the archive mailbox. If you were a compliance officer, the other key thing that this allows you to do is today you have to go and grant permissions in exchange. You have to go and grant permissions in SharePoint. Um, and SharePoint is a completely different permissioning model. Um, and any other third party that you have to grant permissions. And typically the person who grants the archive permissions is not the same person who actually administers the mailbox. Right? Or it could be, it may not be, depends on the organization size. So one of the key pieces of this manage archive mailbox is we want to take all the compliance functionality into one place. And the roles that we created to administer just that, those are the only things that have access over here. So this user can enable an archive, or this compliance officer that you grant the delegate access to can enable an archive, but do nothing else. So think of this as we are separating that tight bond between the admin, the mail admin, and the compliance officer, and giving you separation while fulfilling our promise to keep the data in place. So here, this functionality that got pulled up, the Manage Archive Mailboxes, this is really existing exchange functionality. And th this is a new page that we've created that sits on top of the commandlets, pulls that up, and allows you to enable or disable it. So say, let me go over here, and I click Enable, and you can see over here that you can't actually, I'm gonna get out of, and I'm gonna let that go work on the policy and do that right now, but one of the things that you can see on that page is that you can't actually do anything else other than those few actions. So one of the challenges we heard from our customers was, Really, you want my compliance officer to go to recipients, which is effectively the user administration page within Exchange, and click through those links to enable this? Well, this is simple. They, they can't shoot themselves in the foot. They cannot go delete a user. Another thing that you may have wanted to do is manage retention tags for mailboxes. So what this also gives you a page is to create your retention policies. This user can do nothing else. 
other than create the retention policy, and this is to, um, to give folks a heads up, this is our delete policy for folks who haven't seen it. So how many folks have seen the exchange uh, uh, retention policy experience? Okay, cool. Okay, most folks. So for everyone else, let me say that the exchange experience is um, you have archive storage. You enable the storage. You have preservation and deletion. Preservation is hold, and that's based on the immutable store that we built into the platform. And deletion is retention policies. These names, not so great. I'll be talking about them a little bit later, and, and your feedback on those is also welcome. But this allows you in a single place to actually go and create this retention policy. Previously, what you would have had to do if you wanted to turn it on was go to a user and select a policy and enable it in the recipients page, which is the user management page. Um, and if you wanted to actually create or manage the tags, you would have had to go to the, um, within the Exchange uh, console to manage this. Another piece of feedback that we got was this just applies in the Exchange context to email. So exchange users, and really what our customers want, even though email is 80 to 90% of the data you search and you manage, in compliance, 10%, it's all or nothing. You can't leave out that 10% of administration and say you've got a solution. So really, this will be the face to manage this across all our different workloads. And the architecture is such that as we add a workload, you will see it over here. Okay, and the other thing as you can see over here, that I have managed document deletion policies for sites. We are looking to extend the exchange model of administration using tags and making it standard across all the workloads. So you could actually create a tag in the fullness of time that would then delete content as you wanted it, provided the Yammer admin had allowed it, um, from Yammer or from SharePoint using the same keyword or using the same property in the same setting. Okay. And once again, the other thing that we frequently get asked about is the fact that I manage retention tags in one place and I have to go set them on the user. This is a single list. So this UI will become much more beautiful, but the infrastructure that's under it is something I wanted to share with you. So thank you. So we're going to switch back. And talk a little bit about archiving. Yeah, please. Got it. So the question was, thank you, it's a good question. The question was, do we have a plan around mobile device management? I do when I have a slide later. So we will absolutely get to that. And, and no, no, not at all. And I think, by the way, I am typically, as I, if folks have seen me present before, I love the interactive sessions. So I do like the questions. Um, some of this you will see later. So I have 10 minutes left at the end, and I'm willing to stay as long. And we will have room at the expo as well as an unplugged. Because frankly, that's the best part of it for me, is the questions. So, yeah. so yes, device management, all of the functionality we're talking about, what it would look like over there. We'll talk about it. So today, data storage. This is the Exchange in-place archive. So how many folks have deployed archives in their environment or have deployed archives before? OK, this is really heartening to see. So in 2010, we have asked the same question in every single presentation, right, with Mech, by the way. And there was a time when nobody raised their hands. So I will also be posting a number on how many we have deployed in Office 365. Because that's a common question we get from you. So archive is a frequently misused word. It means, oh, is it my vault and my protected store? Is it just the mailbox, an outlook or exchange? Um, is it actually the, any content that I preserve or delete or can do compliance actions on? The way archive typically we use it is it is the corpus of data that you can take compliance actions on. And in exchange today, the way that looks is the primary and the archive mailbox. The fact that we have these two storage entities is nothing to do with compliance. It is a storage differentiation. And you will see in our long-term investments, we want to abstract that storage differentiation away from you. So the end user doesn't have to think about it. But here, when I say archive and primary, what we have built on the green box is really indicates the immutable part of the exchange store. So this is really, do, do folks know, the immutable part of the exchange store, this was months of work. We actually changed the way exchange XSO, um, the API layers, did any kinds of rights to the system. We ensured that any kind of write or change to the system was blocked if it was called archive. And a copy was created, so data was never lost. 
Do any, does anyone kind of have a guess on what the friendly name of the immutable store within the Exchange Archive platform is? Yes, thank you. Someone said it over here. It, it is a name that um, legal and marketing absolutely forbid us to use. Um, it's, uh, it's the dumpster. For the folks who know it, yes. Um, and you can imagine why um, they, when, you, when you say, I have a brand new compliance solution, I have an immutable platform, what is it called? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so this was effectively a section of the database that allows you to apply um, any kind of compliance policies on it. All of the entire corpus of the store is discoverable, but it is what makes the key element of the platform different from what it was before. And that was our first piece of our investment. The second piece of this is delete policies. So if I have my primary and archive, I have delete policies that effectively allow me to ensure that a certain set of content is deleted from my system. Today, that deletion is based on receive date and user. You say user receive date, and the admin can either say all messages with this receive date or in these folders, or the admin can say the user can decide which messages get deleted. That is the structure of delete policies today. We call it MRM, or retention policy. So one of the things I'd like to call out, just like with archive, where we have archive and our immutable store, is when we say retention policy in this context, we mean delete. It has no reference to preservation. That's been one of the misnomers it's led to. And the reason we separate out preserve and delete as functions is because we are an in-place store. The customer request and requirement is, I want to be able to take these two actions separately. When I actually have a piece of content and I want to preserve it for an next period of time, when that preservation is lifted, that doesn't mean I automatically want to delete it. And so which is why we have two separate cases. So delete is I take an action, I deploy a policy, and I have a variety of reasons. I want to manage my risk, and I have a delete policy on my store. Preservation is where I want to say I want to set a certain section of data out to be absolutely immutable. And I can say that an entire user all their data should be immutable. What that will mean today in the product is all their link conversations, all their SharePoint data, all their exchange email, all of that cannot now be destroyed except by burning every single copy of the server. That's it's always possible. Planes fly into buildings. So. so preservation gives you that guarantee. And today, we have the functionality to do this in Exchange and SharePoint. I will be showing you a little bit later the first piece in our Univite compliance demo, where we actually allow you to do preservation or hold um, across Exchange and SharePoint through the new console. Futures. There was one question about deletion, and I'll make sure it's covered later. You said receive date. There is data in the mailbox that doesn't have receive Great question. Excellent. So the question was, you said receive date. There is data in the mailbox that doesn't have receive date. So there is a, a session by uh, Julian on my team. Julian, do you mind just raising your hand? Um, that will be later. You'll see it at the end. That will go into detail on preserve and delete. I'll give you the short answer for now. We use wherever something has a receive or a create date, we use that because that's the obvious one. For the others, we've actually spent some time with our legal team and sort of various products and did competitive analysis to see what would be the most appropriate property to use. For example, for calendars, it's creation date. Right? Some products use um, uh, the last update date. Right? That's something that we get an ask about. But for each of these, we make a, a decision based on the data type. And Julian will talk about that in more detail. OK, archive futures. Great question. So the question is, how do retention and preservation play together? Julian's session will walk into this in excruciating detail. Because this is a 200 session, I could walk into it here, but I'm thinking, I'm, I don't want to lose three-fourths of my audience on that. And it would be, frankly, it would be a pleasure to walk into it because we spent a lot of time engineering this um, in, in 2010. But uh, because, so the, in, a, in a nutshell, preservation always trumps deletion. And unless you specifically say that the end user must be overridden, the admin chooses to, the end user can be overridden. If not, the end user gets to uh, decide whether something's deleted or not. 
And the details of that we should talk about after this because I think you have a specific scenario in mind and we can go into that. Okay, futures for archives. So today we get about, in Office 365, we get about 200 requests a week for larger archives for a given user. So archives in exchange are per user entities. And the archives of an organization are really the combination, the sum of all the archives of each user. And discovery effectively searches across all those units. We have a significant number of customers who come to us and say, I need for my single user a larger archive. And what we have found is that typically an organization There'll be about 1% of users in a large organization that will have one user who has a terabyte archive. All the other archives are in the 2 to 10 gig range, well below. But there's this one user, and there, that user has to be discoverable. That user has to have a delete policy work on them. And so this is, today, the solution for this is that one user, we actually handle the breaking it up and doing the work for you. What we're investing in is to change the platform, that immutable platform you saw that has those. We're extending that platform so that you as an admin can come in and say, I want an additional archive. And in Office 365, under the covers, what we will do is using the provisioning logic that we already have for mailboxes, we will provision those additional mailboxes for you. And the archive can grow as long as you have paid for the E3Cal. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to have that conversation with IT. On the on-premise stories, of course, you have to manage this. But the management of it will now be folded in into the management of the provisioning of your existing mailboxes. It is not something you have to manage separately. And yes, you can still have it on a separate store if you so want. But if you choose to go with the very large uh, DAS model, you can choose to put them all in the same store and get those savings. Those will be true as well. So this is a big investment on our team. And we're working very closely with um, it's really a kind of a store piece of work because a lot of us came from the store team, so from um, the Exchange store team. And though this is that piece of functionality, and you will see, hopefully in the next mech, um, what that will look like. Ingestion, a big piece of why you need to go big is the 600 terabytes of data people are bringing in. And so I talked about that a little bit as well. The key piece of investment we're making there is MRS which is the mailbox replication service with an exchange, is the most efficient mechanism to pull data into exchange. And what we have done is we have built a layer around the throttling and the management of MRS so that you can do effectively a set it and forget it. Perhaps not completely forget it because you always want to know what, what stage of your ingestion you are and how the data is flowing in. But this is for you to be able to bring us a bunch of your hard drives. And in the first version, it'll be IT managed, so you will have to put them on a server and upload them. In the fullness of time, our hope is a bunch of hard drives, right? You can ship them, and they will then eventually appear in your archive in a workflow uh, with Azure that will enable that. Great. OK, thank you. Please join the gentleman. Please, folks, feel free to clap. <laughs> so I mean, it, just to be clear, we, we spend years working on this. So it is, um, and when we're discussing this in a conference room within the team, Nobody is clapping. <laughs> so we really appreciate um, that. So thank you. The third one, and that's where actually I expected to see the clapping, is public folder compliance. Yep. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so one of the things, and, and we know public folders is a it's sort of the painful subject. It's like, it's like a, when you have a long marriage, and, and there are so, those things that you know the other person is done. You've got to forgive them and move on. And, um, it's, and, and sometimes it's not done and things come up in conversation. So, so public folders is, is one of those with, between Exchange and our customers. And we take it seriously. It's not forgotten, right? J j just because he didn't say anything about forgetting your birthday doesn't mean he doesn't remember that he forgot. So, um, so essentially, what we were, our, our staged approach was effectively we changed the architecture of public folders, right, in exchange. And we needed that architecture to effectu effectively stabilize. And we're working through many other things that we want to fix about public folders. But in parallel, what we're also working on is making sure that things like deletion, preservation, and e-discovery work for public folders. So that's on our list. 
And in fact, Quentin, on my team over there, you have the applause, right, Quentin? So this is why it's really important to make it happen. Um, and the last one is unified preserve and delete. So I talked about uh, preservation and deletion, and I showed you this in the compliance portal where you're going to do mailboxes separately and SharePoint separately. We want to bring it all in one place. You don't have to deploy a separate workload for it. You can do the role management in one place. And this will apply to everything that I talk about in this session. OK, I'm going to move on to DLP and encryption. I'm, encryption. I'm going to spend a very few minutes on this because it's part of our overall compliance overview. But we have a, a full-scale DLP overview session as well as a deep dive on both of these. And today I think of these, the key point that I want to call out is today I think of these as data in transit scenarios. Right? You encrypt something as the mail is coming in. Once it's come in, you can't really do much to it. DLP, you do something to it as it's coming in. Well, as you saw in the keynote, our long-term intention and our wish is to blur that line, make it so that when you take an action, a compliance action, you're able to do it across data and transit and data at rest. If you pick a date, and I'll show you when I do the unified hold, if you pick a date, that's in the future, effectively what you're saying is for future content, take this action. So I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But that sharp line between data in transit and data in rest and having different experiences between those is something we want to blur. Oops. So today, you prevent risk with DLP. And I think of DLP as the protection of the sharing action. So anytime you collaborate or share, DLP is there to protect your end user from taking a decision that you don't want them to take. So we typically, what we have found in the attacks that we get in Office 365 and across the board is malicious end users for the DLP or the data loss prevention case are a smaller subset than ignorant or careless end users. And so allowing end users to have that productivity without actually um, interrupting their workflow but ensuring that your organization is protected is the heart of this. There's also some logic that we built um, into detecting certain kinds of data in your environment. So how you can determine if data that is in your environment is, looks like a social security number, or a salary number, or a passport number, and you saw this in the keynote. Well, effectively, that used to be something you could only do on the fly. Well, we're working with the FAST team to take that data in transit work and put it into the platform such that you will be able to query your environment and say, how much data do I have that looks like this? It's got a social security number in it. And if it's got a social security number in it, then I want to audit everyone who looks at it and turn on auditing. Or I want to make sure that that content never leaves my organization. So this work was, has been done for SharePoint because um, the indices of when you actually do document collaboration, the recall required, just go down, jump into the details for a moment. Um, the performance that's required is actually different from when you do it on email. When we do it for email, we have to be very, very careful because what you're doing is actually changing how we index the data. And so but that is work that we, we want to do and we want to do going forward. In fact, the dev who built it on, is going to look at building it for our team is sitting right here. Sami, do you want to raise your hand? So yeah, if you, if you demo it and you don't like it. Um, and by the way, this is his first, uh, I think this is his first time to Mac and his yeah. first time to a conference. So don't be kind at all. Yeah, so it's like, it's, it's, it's like doctors who go through residency. We want everyone to you know, get, get that authentic feedback that all of us have. Um, and encryption. So here, once again, these operations that were typically thought of as data and transit operations because they're very performance intensive and risky for uh, data at rest. We are looking at extending them for data at rest. And encryption is another one, right? It's easy to encrypt it when it's on the fly, but imagine going through your databases and touching that. Don't want to do that, but that is a need and an ask that customers have of us. So that's a long-term direction. So there will be a detailed session on this. I won't spend a lot of time on that. I will move to e-discovery. So great. Let's take a moment. OK. So I talked about those interesting criteria the DLP allows you to do. Well, e-discovery is all about searching your organization and being able to take an action based on the result set that you find. Today, we have the multi-mailbox search. 
And it is built on the FAST indices. So one of the big pieces of investment when I talked about the in-place platform is we did a lot of work with the FAST indices to make them e-discovery capable. So it's a, interesting, when, when the team first started working on e-discovery, which was two or three years ago, we were um, humorously talking about what, what, would, what would our logo be? And one of the places we ended up, and the, the various uh, names that we looked at were Big Brother. There was, a, it was an icon of an eye in a, in a, in a badge. Um, yes. There was another one. Our tagline was, uh, we read your email. <laughs> Didn't go down very well. But in a nutshell, I think when we built this, um, this technology, the power of it was, until then, you had no easy way to span your entire organization and query all your data. And so this is what eDiscovery did. And what we're doing with eDiscovery today is extending that. Today, we span and get your data. Tomorrow, we're going to span and also search for your metadata. We're going to be able to search for other data sources with a single query. We extend it to Exchange and SharePoint. We're going to extend it beyond to Yammer and anything else that you ingest into the service. The second part of eDiscovery is in the legal context, we built a specialized legal tool um, that our MSIT legal uses, right? Um, and they are not forced to do it. Joe and EJ, would you mind just raising your hands? Thank you. This is MSIT legal. So those of you who know, we are a, um, a company that is uh, sued an odd bit. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, litigation is very familiar to us. And all of us on the e-discovery team have gotten that odd phone call that says, by the way, we're in the middle of a lawsuit, and, and if, especially because they're on dog food, um, there's an e-discovery query we're trying to run. You cannot forward this mail. Do not talk about it to anyone, but please be at this phone call to talk about how we're going to get this data out. So e-discovery is effectively one of those capabilities that we built as a search across the entire org, but what it's turned into is this litigation-intensive, must-have-it-right-now, um, significant impact if you don't get the results that are accurate, reliable, and timely. And so those are the investments we're making there. Today, it's built on the fast mailbox indices, and it gives you the following actions. You can do a search, and then you can preserve that content, or you can export it. The second piece of our long-term vision is in addition to searching and preserving, and this, by the way, is the SharePoint console where we do it that is going to then be followed by the unified console. Our long-term vision is to allow you to take any action you want as a result of that search. So if we think of e-discovery, I think of it as if we, the way we have it today allows you to do a certain quality of search, but when you want to search an enormous amount of data or you want to search in an extremely timely manner, the edges the feedback that we've gotten from you are the edges of that, the seams start appearing. And so our investments are to eliminate those seams, make this search possible across an enormous corpus of data, and to ensure that the data we get back, the reliability, the accuracy of it, is as needed by a court of law. And the second piece of it is to extend it, not just to do a preservation or an export, but to also allow you to take an action like delete or to take an action like audit. So the, imagine, find every credit card number in my organization and then set up audit logging for every user that views it. That's effectively the vision that we're going towards. The architecture diagram, because I couldn't resist, and I'm not going to spend time on because it's a 200 level session, the green effectively indicates the way we're going to make that possible by taking the data today or the operations today that lived in the indices and on the workload and pulling them out so that we get better throughput and better return on the queries and are able to provide an SLA for very large data sets. Our SLA today is good for a certain data set and really it meets 99% of our queries, but we want to give you that 1% additional, that one customer who wants to search 100,000 mailboxes in their org. And that's the kind of investment we're making to enable it. Great, so I'm going to show you the new. Yep. Would we be talking on the e-discovery process as an elective? Would we be talking about something that is an Great question. So the question was e discovery is so dependent on indexing. Will we talk about the indexing architecture? So, not in this session, because it's an overview session and we're talking about everything. But Quentin has an e discovery session immediately after this in this room, and we will absolutely be talking about the architecture. Right? Um, he's going to walk you through some of the demos, but what he's also going to talk to you about, and really, we have a very close relationship with the FAST team. 
right? Effectively, they are, uh, they are the engine, and um, uh, if, if they fail, right, we, we have a very close immediately in the service when there's a fast issue. How do we find out about it? How do we respond to it? So things like that about how we're changing the way we provision mailboxes to ensure that we get that kind of throughput, we increase our capacity, we add additional properties to the index, we change the pipeline that we index, et cetera, things like that are absolutely things we're looking at. And feel free to ask Quentin any questions on that. So here, I'm going to create a unified whole. So I talked a lot about our unified architecture, and then I talked about our preservation on immutable platform. This is the first action that we built for unified hold. And this was, um, so let me create a new policy. So once again, the UI was to sit on top of an enormous amount of code, and, and everyone in the audience asked for, for a demo. So. so here, I'm going to give it a name. Anyone have a preference? OK, we'll call it the session. So what would you like to look for? So let's look for patent. And now here, I'm going to specify what are my date ranges. Nothing fancy. This is the usual um, actions that you like to take. And then I decide where I would like us to look, mailboxes and sites. You could imagine where it says mailboxes and sites, excuse me, that extending to Yammer, Link, Bloomberg, and additional data sources. That's how we wanted to look, with the same criteria. right? And if certain criteria are not supported at various times, you will see that difference. You will also, in the fullness of time, see all the richness that we have of refiners and near searches and the complex queries of and, or. So this particular page is to show the eventual direction that we want to go in giving you a single unified console. So this is my query. And there's another thing that I also mentioned, which is if, for example, the date ranges that I had put in were entirely in the future, you could imagine that to be an action for the future. Make sure that any content that fulfills this criteria in the future is encrypted. Any content that fulfills this criteria in the future cannot be shared or cannot be sent. So the question was about Bloomberg, and hold that thought. So I'm going to add these. I'm going to add these folks. Ah, thank you. Great question. The question was, can you not select by group? Not in the demo version, but absolutely. <laughs> right? um, it was, so if you want to think about what it took to actually get this out there, th we were having conversations about, hmm, so do we need to correct this bug where someone misspelled um, archiving? <laughs> Um, versus, uh, and so those were the, for the, to get a piece of this together, to get the platform together, it's not there in this current version, but absolutely our intention is to do this by groups. You have this in EAC today. We want to allow you to do this. It would be ludicrous to expect you to um, add every single person. Um, EJ and Joe today search um, hundreds of users at Microsoft. We have 180,000 employees. Not viable for them to be adding, um, unless they hire several people to just do, that, do just that. But um, e-discovery has traditionally been such a manual process. We're looking to get away from that. So that's just a for demo. That's, that's what I sort of said in the earlier where I was saying that in the original version, um, and in fact, I recommend highly that people come to Quentin's session because he will show you what we have today with uh, proximity searches. Um, with proximity searches in the eDiscovery Center based on the, whoops, let's try this again. Everyone holding their breath, that is always a good thing to do when. Okay. Great. So I added a SharePoint site. And I added, say I added a set of groups, and really what I'm doing over here, you could imagine if you had another paradigm that was, um, if I wanted to just add a user and ensure that all their link content was preserved, I would just select that user in the first page. So instead of mailboxes, what you would see is select users. Um, so I think you had a question about 
Yeah, phrases. So the e-discovery capabilities that we will actually aspire to, this is the demo version, next session with Quentin, the Bloomberg capabilities of actually pulling that data um, in. Today, that is a manual process that is partner-based. Long term, we'd want to see about how we can make that easier. You know, so the question was, can I bring information into a new site and bring it back? It will depend entirely on customer need and the API, but really on customer need. So would we enable that? E-discovery is a tricky thing. You don't want to bring everything in. Okay? So that will depend on today. We actually don't have that as an ask. We specifically have customers saying, no, please, don't bring in all this additional data into my system, so then I have to then discover it and be responsible for producing it in court. So the answer for that is no, but intentionally. If we hear from you that there is a certain data source you want us to pull in, we will do that. So here we go. We have the unified hold across Exchange SharePoint. These are the keywords. It's called MEC EDC. I have a start and an end date. I have four mailboxes at a site included, and I'm going to hold this content indefinitely because I don't know how long I'm actually going to need this, so I'm going to keep this. You could also preserve it only for a specific date. And then when you preserve it only for a specific timeline, what would happen is the content would be gone, no longer held, but not disappeared from the system. OK, great. So I am going to. Well, that comes back. So jumping from this, yeah, the ring of death. Sorry, there's another question? Will this do any drill down, intelligent drill down, as we go more toward linking the documents and it not being actually embedded in the mail, one drive as opposed to sharing? That's a great question. So the question was, will this do? This is not a good sign. OK, well, you know what? Let me, let me switch to back to the slide, and then I will come back here, which I absolutely promise. Um, and we have to come back here for the. Uh... So the question was, will it do intelligent drill down of attachments and content like that? Um, yeah, absolutely. And the question is yes. We are looking at, and this is really in the near term, we are looking at ensuring that the, one of the data sources that I mentioned when I said SharePoint, to include OneDrive in that. And effectively, that is work that um, when you actually specify, I want to search for this user, you will be able to get that OneDrive content pulled in as well, as long as it's corporate data. Good question. So hold that thought. I'm just to do a time check. That is, that is a great question. We have an answer for that. Let me follow that up at the end of this, because I want to make sure I get through a couple of the auditing and the customer ask slides, right? the feedback we've gotten from customers. So oh, at the end of this, so for auditing, um, today we have this mechanism in these various stores where we go off and we collect audit data. So you turn it on for Exchange, and you turn it on for SharePoint, and you pull that audit data about that user. We have something called admin auditing. And we have mailbox auditing. And we have a session. We're investing heavily in auditing specifically, because if this wasn't compliance, you'd be done with archive, preserve, delete, and e-discovery. But because with compliance, you have to prove absolutely everything, this is our investment to make sure you prove it. We're making changes in both the API layer of all these workloads, so that when a new action is added in the workload, we're able to call that data in. And we're investing in an auditing store that is going to sit on top of an exchange mailbox that effectively is going to give you auditing commandlets and store all that data and scale to pull that information up on a per user basis. If you ever wanted to ask the question with audit data that you had to sort of answer yourself, what did this user do or who all looked at this document? You've never been able to ask that high level question. And that's really the direction and the intention we want to go. Another thing that we have found that customers come to us a lot, and this is an Office 365 ask, is they say, you know, it's great that you've got the cloud, and I know you guys are, you know, we've been working a long time, but I don't trust you. <laughs> yeah. That's, see, see, we never laugh when we say that at, at Microsoft when we go back in Redmond, but um, I'm glad you see the humor of it because I do too. Um, so the two key pieces of giving credibility is turning on auditing by default in the data center. So today, you go to admin auditing, you turn it on, then you go turn it on for SharePoint, you go turn it to all these places. One thing we want to do is, if you join the service, right, it's on by default. And one of the things we audit by default is every data center action. 
So if Sami, sitting over here, had to look at your data because he had to debug an issue, his name will be redacted, but you will see when he logged in, you will see what data he actually saw, and you will be able to generate a report of that for your company. Sarah on my team is going to be talking about that Tuesday, and that is one of the related sessions. So definitely go there to find out more about it. And the third piece is auditing is only as good as the data sources you get it from. So I talked about Exchange and SharePoint. We're going to go look at getting this from AD so you can actually correlate that information to something useful. Classic example, if I deleted the user in AD and they were still on hold, what happens? Right? I put them on hold in Exchange. Am I going to lose that information? Well, today we don't allow you to lose that information. The, the, whole, the delete is actually blocked in Exchange. But you may want to know that. Why did someone go delete that in AD? What was the action and who did it? So that is the auditing investment. And now I'm going to jump to device protection because we have a demo here and I just want to spend some time on it. So all this um, compliance functionality is really great, but where do end users spend most of their time? So how many folks in this room use an iPhone? Or great, iPad? Great, similar set. Um, how many folks have an Android tablet or a phone? OK, cool. And a Windows phone? Oh. <laughs> did, I, did I say you were the best audience ever? But, but the reality right, of Office 365, we did some exhaustive, we have these graphs to look at what are the devices that most frequently connect to the service. iOS is 80 plus percent. right? For Office 365 to be successful, we have to ensure that we provide the functionality on it. Right? And, and to some of you, that's a yeah. Well, it's been a realization and a journey, and I think we're in a great place, that we take all these platforms seriously. So our goal is to give you that functionality on every platform. Today, you have EAS, which is really great if you want to do three simple things, a pin, password, and you want to brick the entire device. So if you have an important design doc, on your phone and pictures of your child and you leave the company and you did not uninstall the app, right? Who on, it's your phone. Why do you have to uninstall the app, right? It's your device. You bring your own device. Essentially, well, the corporation has two options. They could brick the entire device, which in certain European countries is not allowed because you've actually deleted private data, right? I'm just, and or you just accept the fact that that information is going to then be out in the ether and you have no protection. So this is, again, the case where end users are doing, they're not being malicious. They brought the device. They own it, but they're trying to do work. The line between their work and their personal device is completely blurred. So how do we allow them to continue to have that usage and that efficiency and convenience while allowing the enterprise to protect? So what we're investing in is something that's more than EAS, and easier than MDM. Why do I say easier than MDM? Because today, what you have to do, if you want to be a good citizen, is you bring your own device, you hand it over to your IT admin, along with your firstborn child, and you say, put whatever you want to on this device. And then if something happens, you'll delete that information from it. Typically, you also don't get to use the Office apps. You have to use the homegrown um, apps that come from one of the vendors where, you know, they use Office for everything else, but just on their devices, they have to use this terrible experience. Well, that hurts the Office team. So our long-term goal is to allow you to continue to use Office apps and get mobile device management on top of them. So one of the things I want to show is really just the admin page for our first version of that. So the first thing we had to do from a low-hanging fruit perspective within the context of the Unified Console was if you even want to do EAS, does anyone remember the five clicks I have to do to get to my EAS settings to actually wipe a device? Recipients, thank you, yes. Actually, I have a couple of you raise your hands. So first of all, you go to recipients. And for folks who are wondering what happened with the whole policy, it closed up. It's over here. The MEC EDC policy, and it's enabled. And the pending implies that effectively there is a notification 
for hold that we built in because it's legally required to actually notify the user and create an audit log. And that is what it means. So you got to hold. Sorry we couldn't do it in one place, but this is unified hold across Exchange SharePoint. It is the first action that we have built across all these workloads in a single console. Now I have to go look at the devices page. So today, if I actually wanted to go to, and I'll first show you the new devices page, but if I wanted to go, say, wipe a device, I would go to users and groups. I would then create settings, and we'll do this after I show you the devices page. I would go to settings. I would then go to more details. And then I would say, it would say there, exchange active sync policies. And I would get those three options I talked about. Well, one of the first things our customers have asked us for, can I at least just have a page in Office 365 that shows me all the users in my org that have devices and actions I can take on them? Seems a really simple ask. And if I have to ever go and do this individually to every user, this is hard. And I think it's back to that gentleman's question about, will I be, will I be able to have groups? You have to. You can't have to do this on an individual basis. So what we've built is this devices page. And really, this is brand new code that um, the team sent me mail about on, on Friday. I said, add your devices. And I said, if you don't get the code ready, I will make you add your primary device, and I will wipe it on stage. <laughs> so so um, as you can see, they got five devices. And I suspect none of those are essential. <laughs> so. Um, so these, this view is effectively a look in my organization of my devices and the ability to actually take action on them. Right here you can see the factory reset device, and this is the full wipe of the device. In the fullness of time, here you will actually be able to see selective wipe. You'll be able to see things like audit user or prevent, enforce enrollment, or prevent copy and paste. In the fullness of time, the actions you want to take on the device, you will be able to see them on that console. And the actions that you will see will be dependent entirely on the feedback you give us. So please, let us know what you want to see. Selective wipe is the first thing we're going after because nobody wants to lose their child's pictures. Yep. What about Great question. So by the way, before I go, does anyone want to pick which of my unfortunate team um, all of them. Uh, we have an anarchist in the audience. <laughs> That's it. I was hoping Astrid would be here because what I wanted her to do was groan really loudly in the back of the room, um, but, but she couldn't make it. So, okay, I'm going to switch back over here and get back to the question. So thank you. What you have effectively done over there is wipe the device in the fullness of time. You will say selective wipe. And it will only delete your corporate data. So, you had a question? Saying, what about reconditioning? Where, for whatever reason, you want to start over, or it's just a point of migration? Awesome question. I will answer that. And was there another one here? Yeah? So, Actually, I'm going to take that gentleman just because he. How do you plan to uh, have consistent uh, features as a platform? Ah, great question. B both brilliant questions. So, one was reprovisioning, and the other one was how do I plan to have a consistent feature set across platforms? So on the first reprovisioning, um, there will be a set of actions that the admin can take. One of them could be delete content. Um, one of them could be uh, re force re-enrollment. And so there'll be mechanisms there. And what the end user will do is see an experience that says, please re-enroll. Different platforms with a lot of work. <laughs> and so the answer to that is we have become intimately familiar, our team, um, with what it takes to create an enrollment pop-up across all platforms. And this is something that's happening across Office. So there are certain challenges. Um, Samsung, for example, has a, uh, a secure store, right? It knocks. It's not publicly, but it has a um, secure container that effectively you can put stuff in that and say uh, things won't happen outside, uh, be allowed outside that container. iOS doesn't. So for each of these, we have to come up with a solution which has a consistent experience that's across all of those. And really, it is a detailed design discussion, understanding each of the platforms, having very detailed conversations with the engineering teams in Apple and the Knox engineering team, and determining what is the experience we can give our customers. Um, OK, so 
I'm going to have just a couple more slides and then we are done. And so the thing that I want to call out on this slide is today in Office 365, we have 2 million users on hold and 200,000 being added on a monthly basis. So for those of you who wonder, is this real? Do people actually use this? This is the data that I can share. We have customers today. Compliance is an interesting one. People keep asking us for case studies. Customers don't like to tell you what compliance solution they're using or what the feature set is. But we can share with you the data. And we have seen the graph of this skyrocket. I mentioned earlier, we have 200 requests a month to increase the size of our archives to actually be able to store more data. We have a million plus archives in the service today. This is an IT admin has gone in and actually configured their system for archiving and for move to archive policy. And we have 45 million mailboxes that are using delete. A lot of our customers, what we've noticed, and we are trolling through all this data, a lot of our customers use it to clean up. They use junk mail and deleted items. Some of the others of our customers actually deploy these end user policies. We're collecting data on how many of them are split into those two categories. So my suspe I suspect with the 45 million, it is not people doing it just for compliance. It's people doing it for garbage collection. But one of the data points that gave us is this feature is being used across both of those scenarios. The typical companies that we have is we have a few highly regulated companies that ask us for compliance functionality and spend conference calls with my team and uh, give, them a, give them a hard time. And we have a lot of small and medium orgs. And lastly, um, archiving was added to this year's Gartner Magic Quadrant. Um, the interesting thing about that addition was that we actually didn't drive it. Um, and I don't know if Alan's in the room, but Gartner told us that effectively customers were asking them about it and they had to include it in the quadrant because people wanted information about it. So two years ago, if you asked me, come on, does, does the solution have legs? I'd say, wait and see, right? We're, we're doing all the engineering work. Um, this is the data I use to determine if the work we've done is answering a customer need. OK, this is the questions we get. I put them up on the board because if you have questions about this, we should absolutely discuss it in the unplugged. And this is a summary of our future investments. So just to close, when we started about two and a half years ago, a lot of the questions were about faith. Are you really going to be immutable? Um, will you really scale? Uh, what if a subpoena comes where Microsoft, somebody asks for my data out of Office 365, what will you do? There were questions of faith and distrust and concern about whether the server or the service or even our product, the platform, would answer it. The questions I hear today are questions of feature. They're like, will you do this? It would be great if you did this. And that really, from a software perspective, is the arc of a feature. First, people have got to believe that this thing has legs and it's worth it. And then they start asking you for additional functionality. So I talk through the roadmap. Thank you for all the feedback you've given us over the several years. The solution will not be everything you wanted to on day one, but my hope is that this long-term investment will bring you along with us on that journey. That's all I have. Thank you. So I will be here for questions, by the way. So folks, feel free. Thank you. Please fill out your evaluations, both good and bad. And Feature requests um, and details on that are welcome.